Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told at Untold. My name is Soho. Before we go straight into today's video, I do have to give you guys a couple of content warnings. In this video, I do talk about SSLs, child abuse, as well as self-harm. I don't go into too much detail about any of the topics I just mentioned, but still, if that's not something you think that you're interested in watching, then this video probably isn't for you. So maybe you guys can watch some of my other videos that I'll link up here, or you can wait for my next upload. On Saturday the 30th of August 1997 at around 6 a.m. a group of children were playing in a park in Bertram, Johannesburg and the park had become sort of like a makeshift dumping ground and the children approached a pile with household items that had been thrown out and on top of it was a mattress that had been recently burnt so just in hopes of them maybe finding like a couple of things they could take home or like use as a toy they decided to remove the mattress and as soon as they did this they found the body of a man who had just been burnt immediately police officers were called and they got to the park cordoned it off trying to find as much evidence as they could and as they were doing this um a group of onlookers and curious bystanders had surrounded the park and unbeknown to the investigating officer there was a man in the crowd watching him trying to see what evidence he would find the victim was identified as 35 year old william Crichton, and he suffered from alcohol alcoholism and his wife had recently divorced him and because of this he had to move in back with his parents and he had a job nearby on this specific night saturday he went out and he was on his way home when he decided to just take a shortcut through the park and as he was walking through the park he decided to light a cigarette and almost immediately a young man approached him and asked if he had an extra one for him and not too long after that the young man found a brick and started savagely beating William until William fell to the ground and after this he took William's pants and underwear off and S assaulted him he then managed to get a piece of cloth and strangled William until he unfortunately passed away. After this he found a mattress somewhere in the park placed it on top of William and set it alight. It is believed that while the mattress was burning, this perpetrator did masturbate because he was sexually aroused by the fire. And not too long after that, he just left the scene. He took William's wallet and a pair of shoes with him. But next to William, they did find his glasses, a cigarette lighter, as well as the bloody brick that had been used. Whilst investigating William's murder, the perpetrator struck again. 69-year-old Clarence Pistorius lived right across the park about 300 meters away in a retirement home and on the 2nd of September 1997 he decided to step out of his unit just to have a little like just have a little smoke before he went to bed and this is because he suffered from insomnia so usually at night when he couldn't fall asleep he'd just go outside of his unit and just have a quick smoke in hopes of it just coming kind of like helping him fall asleep or maybe pass time by uh, so at three in the morning he went out for a cigarette and as soon as he lit it a young man approached him and just greeted him and Clarence knew who this man was because this man had recently helped him just do a couple of chores around his unit and this young man's girlfriend lived in the same retirement complex that he did with her mother so this young man coming up to greet him wasn't anything like out of the ordinary even though it was like such an odd time because they knew each other. So the retirement complex that Clarence lived in had multiple units and these units some of them had interjoining bathrooms so I think it would be like two um, units with the interjoining bathroom but they still had their own space. So that night between 3 and 4 a.m. one of his neighbors that he shared the interjoining bathroom with 
um, into a bathroom with a uh, small smoke and she went to go knock on Clarence's door because she thought maybe he had fallen asleep with a cigarette in his hand but as she was knocking on their interjoining bathroom she heard like a voice so she thought that everything was under control Clarence was awake you know so it was nothing to worry about so she decided to go back to bed and literally not too long after that another neighbor heard a loud bang and he decided that he was going to go check in the morning um what the bang where the bang came from rather the neighbor went to Clarence's unit and he saw a pool of blood as well as one of Clarence's shoes right in front of the door. So he decided to start knocking, try to get Clarence's attention, maybe see what had been going on and if he was okay. But he received no response and after this he just decided to let himself in. And immediately he found Clarence lying on top of his bed covered in a burnt duvet. It was clear that Clarence was dead and immediately police officers were called, they arrived on the scene and it was quickly established that Clarence had been beaten with a brick outside of his unit door and then dragged inside of his unit. There he was stabbed in the heart as well as had his throat slit. After this, the perpetrator managed to take off his pants, his underwear, and then is assaulted him. And then he took a can of insect repellent and kind of like just sprayed it on the duvet cover and just like left it on the bed. And then he set it alight with Clarence obviously under the duvet. And he stayed there for a while and watched Clarence burn. And the bang that the neighbor had heard was actually the insect repellent can bursting because of the flames. The murder weapon was not found on the scene and it was also discovered that the perpetrator had stolen a small TV set. Clarence and William's crime scenes were almost exactly the same with the same MO and because of this police officers decided to call in a profiler and her name is Mickey Pistorius. Mickey Pistorius also worked on the Station Strangler case as well as Moses Sotolo who was a serial killer. Um, I've covered both of these cases and if you haven't watched them I'll link them up here so you guys can check them out and maybe see like some of the other work that she's done. So as soon as Mickey went there she was given crime scene photos from both of the crime scenes and she said that at the time it was one of like the worst crime scenes that she had ever seen just like the bodies being burned the fire it was just terrible Mickey then drew up a profile for the perpetrator. Mickey wrote that the acts happened just before sunrise and had each lasted no longer than 20 minutes from start to finish. It's likely that the perpetrator did not appear threatening to the victims or that they knew him and it indicated that he probably lived within walking distance of the crime scenes. He likely watched the fires burn and became sexually aroused by it and he may have recently lost his job because the first murder was committed around payday and it was also committed at a time in the morning where afterwards the perpetrator wouldn't have enough time to go home and get ready for like a normal nine to five job uh, it is believed that he had an average IQ because he had been like smart enough to pick up vulnerable victims and he thought to remove the knife from the second scene. He was said to be a disorganized killer. His killings were very opportunistic and largely unplanned. He likely traveled on foot. He came from a dysfunctional background and likely had been abused as a child and as an adult he wasn't very successful and probably lived with one or both of his parents. The family members that he lived with really didn't care about what he did with his everyday life so he could go in and out of the house as he pleased whatever time so because of this he was more likely to get away with the crime because they really didn't care what he was up to and he could just hide it very easily. It is believed he knew someone who lived in the retirement home and this allowed him to go in and out whenever he wanted and he was able to look for a victim. He had likely taken trophies as a memory from 
the crime scene and he would assert himself in the investigation and maybe call in anonymous tips because he enjoyed being the center of attention for like the first time in his life like he loved the attention that the crimes he committed would be getting and um, he was very satisfied with groping and this is because um, the victims had been is assaulted but they had not been raped or sodomized so um, he didn't really get his sexual gratification from the groping but rather he would get like his sexual arousal and gratification from the fires that he would set. Um, this is what would um, basically just get him off and this is what's known as a paramaniac, someone who is sexually aroused by fires. Yes, fires. 25 days later, a man named Alexander Lonsberg was being stalked. He lived in the west of Pretoria and he was at a bar when a young man approached him. And this young man basically asked Alexander to buy him a drink and Alexander did. And the two of them got to talking, just kind of getting to know each other, basic conversation, you know. And as they were speaking, this young man told Alexander that he was kind of sad because he had been kicked out of his home and he had nowhere else to stay and Alexander just being a very nice and vulnerable man at the time he was very intoxicated because they had been drinking that night he just kind of offered this young man a place to stay at his flat he was like it's no problem so after a while the two of them left the bar and they went to Alexander's flat the perpetrator managed to get a knife and he stabbed Alexander 47 times. After this, he took a pile of his clothes, placed them on top of Alexander and set it alight. And after this, he just went around the flat, stole a couple of things, including Alexander's car as well as his dog then he got into the car and sped off alexander's body was found the next day i'm not too sure how it was found but i'm assuming maybe because of the smoke uh maybe one of the neighbors smelt it or people in the area saw that there was a fire but alexander's body was found the next day and when police officers got there they did notice that sexual activities had taken place the night before but they're not too sure whether it was consensual or not. Surprisingly, the perpetrator didn't take uh, Alexander's phone. So because of this, the police officers had it and he decided to dial the last number that had been called the night before. And a woman answered and her name was Annie, was Anne-Marie Fender and she lived in Kimberley. And she told them that she didn't know who Alexander was, but she had received a phone call from that number the night before and it was from her son. Her son's name was Jan Adrian van Verstaysen and he was 24 years old. He had called his mother to tell her that he had done something really bad and that he was coming home and after a couple of hours he arrived at his mother's house in Kimberley and to her surprise he was driving a car and he had a random dog with him. He then gave the dog to his mother and said that he'd be back but he's going to Durban and then he got into the car car again and drove down to Durban. The Burham investigating officer found out about the murder that had taken place in Pretoria, contacted that investigating officer and they got together, compared notes and they discovered that all three murders had the same MO and were likely from one killer. They then managed to get a hold of police officers from Durban and they managed to locate Jan van Verstaysen and they arrested him on the 21st of October 1997 and brought him back to Johannesburg where he was questioned. Jan quickly admitted to having murdered Alexander in Pretoria and he told them what had happened that night and that Alexander had offered him a place 
to stay but it came with the condition that they had to have sexual intercourse and this kind of made him upset which is why he decided to kill Alexander but he was very adamant that he had not killed the two men in Johannesburg he was like nope I didn't do it and the police officers really didn't believe him because they were like it's literally the same M.O. and we don't know why he admitted to like the first murder but won't admit to like the other two but it's fine we'll get him somehow. Jan had pyromania, he had burn marks on his head from trying to set himself alight multiple times. He had been arrested multiple times as well for robbery and one of his prison cells in Kimberley had been set alight and whilst he was in prison for the murder of Alexander, he somehow managed to escape. So he escaped from prison and he was hitchhiking and there was a good Samaritan that picked him up and as he was driving um, Jan to wherever he was going they started speaking and Jan basically told this man that he was just looking for a job so this man told him that no it's okay the next day they could meet up at a shopping center because this man um, was going to offer him a job so they were just going to speak more about it the next day so he dropped Jan off and they agreed to meet each other the next day and as soon as this good Samaritan got home and picked up the newspaper he saw that the man that he had had in his car was the man that had recently somehow managed to escape from prison and he was a murderer so immediately he called the police officers let them know and they set up a trap so the next day this uh the next day the police officers went to the shopping center so they could arrest Jan when he got there to meet this good Samaritan and that is how he was apprehended again with Jan being back in prison, the police officers still tried to get him to confess to the two murders that had happened in Johannesburg and Jan was not going to admit to something that he claimed he didn't do. The following year, in June 1998, an informant gave the investigating officer some information and basically just told him to look into a murder that had taken place six years before, in 1992. This man had also been found in the park murdered. He had been beaten with a brick and been stabbed with a I think beer bottle with like a glass bottle and then he was just left for dead but the investigating officer didn't think it had anything to do with the murders that had taken place the year before in 1997 because there was no indication of a fire and also this victim was of a different race so he just didn't think that they were linked however he still decided to just look into this murder and maybe try and solve it because even though it wasn't related he would I could still be able to solve a murder and yeah just it would have been like a good thing so they discovered that the bottle that had been used was left on the scene and it had fingerprints which was such a good thing they put these fingerprints in the system and they had a match and the fingerprints belonged to a man called Norman Hopkirk. Norman was 25 years old and he lived with his parents. His parents lived in a flat that overlooked the park where both of these men had been murdered, the unidentified man from 1992 as well as William that had been burnt uh, yeah, that had been burned the year before. So they looked him up trying to see where he was and they discovered that he was currently in prison serving an eight-year sentence for manslaughter and robbery in a neighboring town. Almost immediately Norman confessed to the murder that had taken place in 1992. He said that on that day him and a friend were walking through the park when they were surrounded by a group of men who tried to attack and rob them but somehow they managed to escape. Then later that night he returned to the park and he found one of the men and this is when he decided to attack him 
for what they had tried to do to them earlier that day. After he stabbed this man with the bottle, he called police officers anonymously and then he went home and once he got to his parents' flat, he looked through the window, looked at the park and he saw police officers arrive on the scene. The victim was alive when police officers got there and the ambulance but unfortunately he was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Police officers then tried asking him about William and Clarence's murders and at first he was very hesitant but eventually he did admit to having killed both of them as well. He said that he knew both Clarence and William. He knew William because he had seen William just walking around the park on many occasions and he knew Clarence because he had helped Clarence um, with some chores in his apartment. So it was very easy for him to just kind of go up to them because they like knew him and they knew his face and things like that. He was very quick to admit to the murders but he denied setting the fires like he said that after he killed William like he just left them there in the park he didn't set uh, the mattress alight and in Clarence's case he said that there was a candle next to the bed that fell on top of the duvet and that's what set uh, the duvet alight but they discovered that the duvet had no indication of any candle wax on it nothing like that and it was just a bit weird because he was so quick to admit to murder but like once you start talking about fires he's like nope i had nothing to do with the fire like you're okay with murder but you're not okay with the fire it's just weird Mickey, the profiler, discovered that both Jan and Norman matched the profile that she had written out almost to the T. They were so identical. People would think that it was like one person, not two people. Or they could almost be brothers because everything that she had written, they both matched it completely. So Norman's father was an alcoholic and his mother was very abusive towards him. He had been sexually assaulted by his father as well as some cousins and throughout his life he had been taken out of his parents home and just put in different foster care homes. He had been in prison, different reformatories and in all these institutions he had been sexually assaulted as well and due to all the sexual abuse that he had faced growing up he did decide to start self-harming I think from the age of 10 and once he got to grade 10 he just decided to leave high school and he had managed to get a job but not too long after that he did get fired and then he got another job as a truck driver but at this point he had become an alcoholic and because of this he was fired and it was discovered not too long after he was fired, he did commit his first murder, which went hand in hand with the profile that Mickey Pistorius had written up. Norman says the reason why the murders took place was because as soon as he saw his victims light up their cigarettes, that like flick from the lighter or like the match kind of just like set him off and it was a done deal just like Jan he also had burn marks all over his body from just trying to set himself alight and his mother says from a young age he would continuously like hit his head against the wall he would set fires in those little like metal dustbins and just watch it burn because that's what he enjoyed in September 2000, Norman Herbkirk was found guilty on all three charges of murder. He was sentenced to two life sentences as well as an additional 20 years for the murder in 1992. Jan van Verstation, on the other hand, was sentenced to 30 years for the murder of Alexander Landsberg. The reason why this case is so interesting and so different is just because these two men were pyromaniacs. They had the same MO, they operated during the same time and the likelihood of that happening, like having two pyromaniac killers operating at the same time is so unlikely and almost unheard of. Like just the odds, like what are the odds? 
but yeah that's it for today's case if you guys have any comments please leave them down below i'm so interested to hear what you guys have to say about py pyromaniacs and all of that so let's chat guys <laughs> and i'll see you guys next time